Welcome into episode six of the Kentucky Round Ball Roundup. I'm your host, Jack Pilgrim of Kentucky Sports Radio. Happy to be joined once again by Zach Gagan of Kentucky Sports Radio. First off, Zach, how are you doing? I'm doing fantastic, Jack. How are you doing today? I, I got to admit, I, I have been better. Um, it has been a rough, rough week for the Kentucky basketball program and pers- me personally, considering uh, things didn't uh, go your I, way, huh? I have some some crow to eat on, mm-hmm. on this show. This was a uh, little bit of a this will be a little morning session, a little vent session for the three of us. And we'll we'll get to that that third piece here in a minute. But, yeah, it was a, a little bit of a of a little um, just sense of reality there for that that I, I desperately needed so I, I appreciated it uh, we'll we'll get back to that but first we got to talk we have a brand new special guest Brandon Ramsey of Kentucky Sports Radio he is our X's and O's guy former college basketball coach he's a brilliant guy he puts out the best scouting reports and team breakdowns and everything that you need on KentuckySportsRadio.com we are absolutely thrilled to have you Brandon how are you I'm doing great, Jack. I'm looking forward to what hopefully will be a much better weekend for us Cats fans. And we'll just we'll just jump right in there because so last time we did this show, it was last Friday. We were going into well, was it? Yeah, it was, it was last Friday. Two, we were two going, days after Morehead State. Two days after Morehead State, we were going into the weekend of the Richmond game, and I came on this show and I and I, and I was saying, look. Last year's team, you know, for whatever reason, they couldn't beat te- beat teams by a hundred like they should. They just didn't know how to put, you know, keep their foot on the gas pedal and just crush teams. I, I went down this long list of reasons why I was absolutely convinced after the Moorhead State game that this team was a n- no joke national title contender. How I saw all I needed to see, everything they were, you know, the team was just working together perfectly. It just looked like a piece of art as we were watching it against Morehead State. I loved what I saw against uh, against Morehead State. And I went on here and I said, if they go out and they they beat Richmond and Kansas rather, you know, handily, things things go very you know very well. I was going to come on this podcast the very next time. Guns a blazing with hot takes how this is going to be the next 2014-15 team, how there's, you know, they're going to possibly run the table, you know, go down the list of all of the massive ridiculous hot takes whoa man did I just did I jinx the absolute hell out of the Kentucky Wildcats because they could not have looked any different more complete you know it was a it was a complete 180 from what we saw last Wednesday to what we saw against uh, Richmond on Sunday and then again uh, against Kansas on Tuesday it was a very rough weekend um, and that's why we wanted to come back and, and use this opportunity as a me admit that I was wrong like I said I would I said if, if they go out and, and it and takes suck, a big man to admit I'm their good mistakes. With that. I, I was wrong that that's big fine man. that's totally fine um, but we want to talk we, we want to use this opportunity to talk about what happened against Richmond what happened against Kansas especially and where things go from here is our optimism with this team completely gone is this still a you know could this team still compete for a national title or are we starting to think, okay, this is going to be, this is going to be a very, very rough season. Um, so that's why we brought Brandon here. That's why we continue to have Zach. It's going to be a lot of fun on this show. Um, let's start with the Richmond game specifically, Zach. What do you think, you know, from what you were expecting going into that game, going against a, a an experienced group like Richmond, you know, one that wasn't going to be afraid to, you know, punch Kentucky in the mouth, beat them up down low a little bit. You know, what, you know, was that kind of what you, if, if Kentucky was going to lose that game, did they lose the way you you anticipated? I'm not entirely sure what I was expecting going to the Richmond game, because if you do remember, I was the one trying to temper your um, basketball excitement as we as we rolled into that uh, first weekend, telling you that I think it was the nine month lapse of basketball that really had your brain uh, playing tricks on you, if you will, because it was just a case, the Moorhead State game was clearly just a case of talent outplaying whatever talent Moorhead State had. It was just, they were just physically better in every capacity. So it made sense that when Kentucky played a team that had capable ball handlers, plenty of veterans, guys that have been there doing this for years, Richmond's, uh, that point guard was, you know, what he's going to, he could end up being the all-time steals, like, steals, like, like they had, they had players that Moorhead State would, would dream to get, you know, Kenneth Freed style types or whatever. Oh, yeah. So 
looking back, I guess it doesn't really shock me at all. Um, what more so does shock me is just how, you know, after me and Brandon kind of uh, watched some of the game on the Kansas game, but that game and the Richmond game uh, together, they just, just how unprepared they looked and just undisciplined and they just looked exactly like a bunch of freshmen. And I, before, you know, we go and get any uh, deeper into, you know, the doomsday scenarios, I, this is something that I can say just happens every year. And I feel like you both could agree with that. This happens literally every single year with Cal teams. Um, just, it always just varies on the degree of, you know, how up we get and how low we get. So I wouldn't say I'm, I'm too concerned at the moment. Um, but that I was definitely expecting a little bit more um, just sound basketball. Um, but I guess when you're, you know, Keon's not playing, it's literally a brand new team, bad off season. So when you look back at it, it, it kind of makes sense. Um, but Brandon, we're, we're interested to know what, what you have thought here, you know, what have you, what, what did, let's start with that rich or stay on that Richmond game uh, before we get into Kansas. What, what did you see that went wrong? Yeah. Uh, looking back to the Richmond game, you know, and I spent several days on Twitter talking about how good Richmond was and that, yes, they lost Nick Sherrod in the off season. He was a top returning player for them, but they still, I mean, I, I don't know this, but it wouldn't shock me if they're the most experienced team in the country. When, when you look at the number of games their guys have started, the number of games those guys have played, uh, I mean, that they're, they're just really, really good. They have, they have really good senior players. And I was talking to somebody else yesterday saying that, you know, that, that Richmond game was a perfect example of guys on Kentucky, that their athletic lives have been pretty easy. Mm -hmm. that they grew up as five-star recruits. They were McDonald's All-Americans. Most of them went to big-time power high schools. Like, they haven't been punched in the mouth very often. Mm -hmm. And, like, since they were 10 years old. Like, mo they, they probably won 90% of the basketball games they've ever played. And most of those have probably been pretty easy. And that's probably not the case for a lot of the Richmond players. You know, they're just more – you know, th those guys are two, three-star recruits. Probably most of them were probably unranked. That's why they're at Richmond. And they've they've had to get better over the years. And especially being older guys, like, they came into that game excited to try to punk our guys because they thought they were I – I can guarantee you they thought they were better. They thought they were supposed to win the game. And they were going to show it to us. And they were going to enjoy doing it. And I think that's what happened, especially in the second half, when, you know, th things offensively started to stagnate a little bit. And – once Richmond started rolling, I just don't think there was – like, Kentucky doesn't have that in them yet to answer getting punched in the mouth. And that's just something that comes with experience and time. And, you know, that kind of transition to the Kansas game, that, that's not as much what happened against Kansas. You know, it, A, Kansas just has more raw talent to kind of match Kentucky's athleticism and skill. But also, you know, the, they're older guys too and everything, but – you know, and, and Zach can attest to this after breaking it down with him. I mean, that was lack of execution on Kentucky's part a lot of times. And, you know, Kansas is good enough. You know, it's, it's Kansas. Like, we're going to lose to them sometimes, even if we play well. Um, but you know, there's just so many things offensively that, that we could have done better, should have done better, just from an execution standpoint that just weren't there. And, you know, a, a lot of that just circles back to, you know, <laughs> these guys have literally never played basketball together until they started practice. And then, you know, these are the first three real games they've played. You know, ha having Davion Mintz and Olivier Saar, older guys, is nice. But they're still new to Kentucky. They're still new to playing with, with the rest of our roster. So, you know, it, it's just – it's a learning experience. I, I say it a lot. I always said it when I was coaching. You know, winning college basketball games is really hard. And regardless of who you're playing, that's why I, that's why I defended all of our schedules. And, you know, then th this year we kind of took it to a different level. But – you know, playing, playing anybody, including even teams like Morehead State, like, you know, it's just hard to win college basketball games because everybody has a plan. Everybody's coming in with their scouting report on how to beat you. And it's just about execution. And right now, Kentucky is executing at a pretty low level. And I, I will say, you know, kind of going back to, to your point about how it just, I mean, it looked like they just weren't prepared to respond to, to any level of adversity it felt especially against Richmond that they didn't ever think that they were going to lose and, and I think that I think they they kind of 
solidify themselves in the first half said okay yeah we we have matched their talent we've matched their you know we're going into the half you know with a lead and and okay yeah I think I think we got things rolling and the second half it almost think it almost looked like they went in, they went in there thinking all right we just got to get through these next 20 minutes let's get the hell out of here we'll focus on Kansas you know well it just it felt like they never felt a single a single point that they were going to lose that Richmond game and I think Richmond saw that and they were like you do know who we are right you do know how talented we are as a group you know how experienced like we have we've done this before we were going to the NCAA tournament this past year if it wasn't canceled and I think they almost kind of took it as like a level of disrespect like you guys are going to come out of here after after the half play you know non-stop ice isolation just one-on-one I'm gonna you know dribble the air out of the ball try to beat you off the dribble and take a horrible you know floater or, or you know some contested shot at the rim it, it, it almost felt like they were just trying to coast through to the finish line assuming that they were going to go, going to win that game and I think that was the biggest frustration for me and I wrote about that a lot of you know, that that AAU mindset and like what you talked about how they'd just been they had been able to just use their pure individual talents for so long. And, you know, even at like at Peach Jam, you know, that the, even at the Nike EYBL, the highest level of competitive AAU basketball, how even still it's not like coordinated team play. I mean, it's very one-on-one let's get, you know, let's, let's get out in transition. Let's, I'm just going to beat you personally with my pure skill. I mean, they, they, two weeks before the AAU season starts, they say, Hey, uh, I want this five star from California. I want this five star from Indianapolis. Yeah. We're going to, you know, create this little conglomerate of, of individual pieces and let's just throw the balls out. That's usually, I mean, that's, it's not as simple as that, but it's usually a, a very non, you know, not unorganized way of, of doing things. And it, it, I mean, that's literally exactly what we felt like in the second half. It was, let's just, go one-on-one let's you know beat you off the dribble let's just try to overpower you power you with my muscle my athleticism and my you know just pure ability and hope for the best and that was my biggest frustration and I kind of and that, that I think that was my biggest frustration especially going into the Kansas game is I thought Calipari said all the right things after the Richmond game said yeah this is what's wrong we have a lot you know we have a lot of old bad habits to break for whatever reason they're not getting past the the you know the the old high school stuff that they were dealing with they're, they're not you know they're not learning as and growing as a team they're learning and growing as individual pieces and, the, and they just don't know how to play as a team yet so I thought going into Kansas we would get that and I mean it was just rewind repeat the exact same you know when things got tough I'm gonna just try to get mine I'm gonna try to get my personal accolades and my personal stats everybody else you get yours too and and I think that's where things went went wrong specifically Brandon I don't know if you want to um, add on that or 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 Zach um, just that that just personally that's that that was my biggest frustration and I think that's something that that Calipari has to address immediately that's that is number one on the on the docket of, of things that needs just absolutely needs to get fixed and I'll say I think you're kind of seeing you know the, the effects of not having even two exhibition games against Transylvania or whoever mm-hmm. and um even as even having a like a longer off season, you know, I, th- I with Olivier Saar and Davion Mintz, I feel like people are expecting a little bit more from them, and even I was as well. But when you think about, you know, I I would liken it to like NBA players being traded. You know, like a great player can go from one team to another, but if they don't have any, you know, they still have to learn that chemistry. And if you have an entire offense that doesn't know the offense because they haven't learned that offense before, because you're only returning players, Keon Brooks, it's essentially like you're throwing Olivier Starr and Davion Mintz into freshman roles as well. They just kind of know what they're doing a little bit more. Um, so, uh, and then, you know, like I, like I was saying, missing those, those exhibition games, um, I think you're definitely seeing just where, you know, they would kind of work out some of those kinks a little bit more. Um, the AAU mindset, like you are saying, definitely, you know, they didn't, they didn't have those chances with those exhibition games to kind of, you know, break that mindset a little bit and dish passes out more. And it's taking these games where they're getting down, uh, in, you know, in crunch time and they just don't know what to do. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, when you're, when you're talking about those exhibition games, and the, the, the most important part of having that is like having some film to go back and break down. And, exactly. you know, it's, you obviously have that now through three games in the season, but you're having to learn off of games that 
A, you're losing, and and B, they just have, you know, they just mean a lot more. So if you, if you can go play transy, like, yeah, no matter what, we're probably going to win by 30 to 60 points. And you know, some fans can say, like, oh, like, well, what do you even get out of playing transy? Well, like, you still have to run your offense. You're still playing against guys who are, you know, better than high school players, obviously, you know, yeah. they're real college basketball players. And you, you get a chance to to work out some of those kinks. And, and also, you know, the – especially with our younger guys, just getting some confidence is going to be very important. And then that, that's, that's what is going to be hard now to overcome some of these poor shooting starts of BJ Boston, Terrence Clark, even Devin Askew. It's like these guys need to see the ball go in so that they know they're still good shooters. I, I really do think, especially Boston and Askew, like those guys are good shooters. And I think they're going to end up shooting a good percentage this year. But at, start, at some point, there's kind of a little bit of a chicken and the egg scenario of they're not going to start making shots until they make shots. I know that sounds stupid, but like they need to see a couple go in, Mm -hmm. in a game. And then I think you're going to see, you know, BJ Boston is going to have a game where he makes five threes this year. It's it's going to happen at some point. Um, We would like for it to happen sooner rather than later. Um, And and then just to, I know you kind of turned the book to Kansas there a little bit, just to touch on that a little bit more. I mean, when I was breaking some things down with Zach the other day, um, the, there's really three things that stuck out to me in that game in terms of our offense. Um, you know, Jack, you're absolutely right. There was a lot of kind of one-on-one stuff, but um, you know, first and foremost, our spacing is really bad right now offensively. Um, guys are not where they need to be. And, you know, obviously I'm not at practice, every, well, not, not every day or any day, but um, so I, I don't know. It, I obviously can't say exactly what coach Cal is telling them to do, but just, Having been around the game, I feel like I kind of know, just based on general basketball principles, what we're trying to do. And half the time you can see Coach Cal yelling at him, or you can even hear him this year, um, t- telling him where to where to get on the court. And I know that there's a lot of times where our players are actually in each other's way. And it's almost like we're playing four on six because we have somebody that's in the way. Um, secondly, we're running a lot I'm sorry of to interrupt you real quick Brandon do you, do you think do you think that goes back to the AAU stuff and just not probably ever having to to space during an offense some of that absolutely yeah because I mean in in in, in AAU uh, a lot of it you know and people like to rail on AAU I'm not necessarily one of those people but you know it, it's a little bit just the nature of the beast I mean Jack said yeah. you're, you're throwing these teams together two weeks before a tournament so like most of them literally don't practice if they do practice it's like a walk through the day before a game to see if they can have like two plays in. I mean, so it, it, it somewhat comes up with territory that in AAU, yeah, like it's, it's one-on-one basketball. And also even in those big tournaments, it, it's just human nature that like the outcome isn't as important. And it, it's not that the, like, I, I don't buy that the guys don't want to win. Like they're competitive. They want to win, but if they lose, it's really not that big of a deal. Whereas <laughs> When you lose a college basketball game, I mean, it's it's all relative, but like it's kind of a big deal when you lose a college basketball game. Whereas if you lose to the Speed Cindy Heat, nobody's yeah. writing twenty articles on KSR about it um, because it, people forget because you play again at three o'clock that day. So like it, you know, it, it just doesn't really matter. Um, so yeah, that 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 definitely has has something to do with it. Um, and then the, that second point I was going to make was that you know so much of our offense is being run what I would call outside of the scoring area. So uh, especially when Devin Askew's in there, and I, you know, I, I don't want to be too critical of anybody specifically, but like, he's not confident handling the ball enough right now to get us into our offense where it needs to be run. Like that, that there's a lot of times when you're breaking down the film where, um, you know, we don't have a lot of off ball action happening right now, but even when we do, there's times where like there's some screening action around the basket and guys are open on cuts or we could get the ball to Saar in the post, but the ball is literally just too far away to even get it there. And like we're running offense in between like the hash mark at 30 feet and half court, whereas the offense needs to be run, you know, hash mark to three point line and in. And you know, that just comes with confidence, being able to handle the ball a little bit better and then getting some movement around the perimeter. Like even just interchanging with a triple handoff to the wing, like that, that can get your offense down lower and you can start running your actions from there. And, and part of it too, in fairness, like Jay Gilliard and Marcus Garrett 
literally might be two of the best on-ball defenders we're going to face this year. Right. Um, and we just happen to face them in back-to-back weeks. And, you know, those guys are older and they're guarding, you know, at, for over half the game, a freshman, point guard, a freshman point guard who we all know should be a senior in high school. So, you know, th- that's just something we're going to have to get better at. But I, I think that, you know, those two points are, are the main things I see right now is the offense is being run outside of the scoring area. So we're not really giving ourselves a chance offensively. And then our spacing is just non-existent. We, like, we're not getting deep enough into the corners. We have guys kind of run into the ball as if it's fifth grade basketball and they're asking for it. Um, and it's, it's honestly frustrating to watch right now. I, th- I think fifth grade basketball is like that, that is the, exactly what I feel like when I'm watching I mean when I was at a Banker's Life Fieldhouse and we'll get into that experience here in a minute but watching it from in person it was just like these guys have no idea what they are doing out there right now they are so lost so confused and they just think okay I physically don't know what I'm doing right now so just give me the ball and I'm gonna see if I could do something with it and, and I think a lot of people you know, going back to the point of, of, of three point shooting, a lot of people are just like, well, they're just not making shots right now. And it's, it's just, Brandon, as you, as you describe, it's, it's just way more complicated than missing open shots because there aren't a lot of open shots to be no, had. No. They're not creating any, any open looks at all. I mean, it's just dribble, 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 dribble. Uh, okay. There's somebody five feet next to me right here. I'm going to toss it to him. Dribble, dribble, dribble. I mean, there's no creation going on. There's no, no, you know, movement. There's no, you know, screen. I mean, it's just, just mass chaos of, of, like I said, individual talent trying to overcompensate for their lack of, of team knowledge, teamwork uh, right now. And, and I think my, my gut right now even though this is this team is it's a broken offense it's a broken team right now they have really no idea what they're doing it's going to be a a work in progress for quite some time I'm still to this day confident that this is going to be a very very good Kentucky basketball team because you don't get that collection of individual pieces I mean look Terrence Clark is a guy that raw talent I mean, he has top 10 pick written all over him. I mean, just you don't get a six foot seven long wingspan, just pure athleticism, strong core body. You don't get like those players aren't built every like that's not a normal looking basketball like that. I mean, he he has an NBA ready body right now. BJ Boston has a score like just a score first mindset. I mean, with just a, a tool bag of just endless tricks. I mean, just endless but he doesn't know how to team play team basketball right now. Isaiah Jackson, holy hell, he has raw talent more than anybody. I mean, I think in terms of like just pure defensive instincts, he's already up there with, you know, among the, the some of the mm-hmm. best pure defenders we've seen in the – and I know they did a comparison of just rebounds and, and block shots, and he was up there alongside the likes of Anthony Davis and Nerlens Noel, and I think – was it Willie Cauley-Stein was the – I saw the Nerlens in the AD, so, yeah. yeah whatever that one was, he's already in that defensive tier. And he just, again, he has no offensive feel right now. He's, you know, another one of those guys that, uh, you know, talking to his high school coach at Waterford Mott, he got a lot of free reign to do whatever he wanted. And it was a lot of you grab the ball and go. And just a lot of even the same at, at six foot 10, 210 pounds, a lot of the same ISO, I'll take you off the dribble because I'm stronger and longer and, and, you know, obviously more athletic than you that was a lot of, of his as well, but you can see every single player on this roster, at least top six or seven or so have had individual moments where you were like, ah, beautiful. Yes. That right there, right there. But none of them know how to play consistently for 40 minutes right now. And when, when that day comes where they click, and I think we got, I think we saw it for that 15 0 run against Kansas in the first half, midway through the first half, <laughs> we were like, Oh, okay. Like that right there. If they can do this, I mean, there's a reason it was a 15 0 run because they were blocking shots. They were just terrorizing the Kansas on, on the defensive end and they were getting out in transition. They were finding open, open looks. They were, you know, just beating everybody. I mean, it was, it was beautiful basketball, just, just in, in terms of pure dominance. You're like, okay, that's what this team can be. They're not going to be, you know, go on 15 0 runs against everybody and, and just, 
dominate everybody in, in the college basketball world, but you could see that potential of, okay, this can be a, a legitimately great team once they start coming together as a cohesive unit instead of looking at the individual aspects of it. So I, I definitely, I definitely, again, Zach, you know that I tend to be on more of the, you know, sunshine and rainbows. Sure do. Outlook. Hit you in the ass this time. I'm definitely more of the sunshine pumper than the uh, doom and gloom. Yeah, we're going to lose every game this season. This team sucks. Like I, I'm, I'm obviously not there yet. Um, hopefully, I'm. Hopefully, this is the last time that we even have to worry about it uh, hopefully they they start putting things together but as broken as this team is right now and I'll say it I mean this is a long work in progress they're going to lose a lot more games this season like this is going to be a a, a definitely a, a a trying season for multiple reasons but they will put this together I mean there's just there's just they're just too talented not to and that's what that's definitely what I'm uh obviously looking forward to I think there's there's kind of two little points I, I would like to make I think uh, I think Brandon even commented on this when I when I tweeted about it a while ago. Uh, when Isaiah Jackson, uh, Brandon Boston, Terrence Clark, and I think Devin Askew all combined to do one um, bench press of like 185 or whatever it was, there's. I would bet you their shooting percentages would be a little bit better if they could actually make these some of these difficult shots that they're trying to take in the in the paint if they could simply just muscle them together. So I think that is part of it. I think they're just you know, we've seen these guys, they're raw talent because they're skinny and long and tall, you know, and, and, and against teams like Kansas and Richmond who have big burly guys in the middle have been doing this for years. They're just going to push you around. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of it too. And I think the second point is I'm, I'm starting to think that we may need Keon Brooks a little bit more than we thought because of the, just the continuity part and having actually, he actually kind of knows what Calipari wants on offense and what is expected. So he could help with just small things like what Brandon was talking about with spacing and, you know, trying to put the ball in the right area of the court. Um, so, like I wouldn't be surprised whenever Keon does come back, if whatever this mystery injury is, whenever he does heal from it, um, I wouldn't be surprised if they throw him right in the starting lineup just to try and get something together. Like, you know, try and have Brandon and uh, Terrence learn off of a guy who actually kind of knows what he's doing. So those are the two other little points I wanted to make. Yeah. And I, I think moving forward, I'm, out, I'm definitely with Jack that like everything's going to be okay. This, this team is is really good. They're going to be really good. Um, we do this every I year. I think that, yeah, right, yeah. I mean, we, we, we go through growing pains. You know, it, it it sometimes doesn't lead to being one and two. It's because the schedule generally looks a little bit different at the beginning of the season outside of the Champions Classic. But, um, you know, I, I think that if for no other reason than – the defense is already really good. And, you know, mm -hmm. it, 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 it broke down at times against Richmond, but that's partially because of the system they run. Like you can't prepare for the Princeton in two days. It's not, it's just not going to happen. Um, especially when they're guarding guys that have been running it for four years. So, you know, I'm not surprised that we didn't look as sharp on the defensive end in that game, but you know, we were defensively dominant against Kansas for most of the game. And that's going to cover up a lot of holes as we figure things out offensively, because, you know, if we can hold teams to, you know, high fifties, low sixties, like, even if you're bad offensively, you're going to find, I mean, like we still scored 62 against Kansas. I mean, that's, that's bad offensively, but you know, if you're playing teams that aren't as good as like against Georgia tech, that's going to be 75. And it, it, if we guard, like we did against Kansas, we're going to hold them to 60 or fewer. So, yeah. you know, I, I think that the defense, is going to cover up some offensive holes as we start to figure it out. And then, you know, if and assumedly when we do figure it out offensively and things start clicking, we get Brooks back. Um, you know, I, I think that we're definitely in for a successful season and, you know, potential final four run once we, once we get to March. Brandon, I wanted to ask you, because this is something that I noticed while I was watching the game and it was probably – the most confused I got while I was watching it, it was some of the, and I, I get that foul trouble kind of led to some of some of these, you know, questionable rotations, but it felt like some of the lineups Calipari threw out there were desperate, like, like almost just the, no, no real rhyme or reason why specific players were playing alongside some of the others. Like there was one lineup in particular that had, Jacob Toppin and Lance Ware in together down low. And that was just mm -hmm. something I looked at and I was like, 
right now this team needs an offensive punch, but unlike – and I, I get that Jacob Toppin ended up being the one guy that kind of put Kentucky yeah. back in it. But that those two pieces are probably, to be totally honest, the, the weakest two offensive pieces we have on the roster, to be totally honest. I mean, I, I think that's fair. At least everybody else has their, you know, their go-to whatever. I, I still to this day don't know what Jacob Toppin brings to the table on a consistent – you know offensive sure yeah and that's that's what it boils down to but in just a in terms of pure offense he's not a catch and shoot guy he's not a staying in the corner with your arm you know hands ready like Cameron Fletcher is he'll knock down 30 percent of those attempts 30 mm-hmm. you know, maybe but that's still something I still look at Jacob Toppin and Lance Ware as the two probably weakest links on offense defense okay fine even though Lance Ware was getting pretty pretty manhandled there for for that long stretch but when Kentucky needed a basket and they needed some level of cohesion, Cal went to those two. And then I think there was even one lineup that had those two. It was what ask you Davion Mintz, Cameron, no, maybe Dante Allen, Lance Ware and Jacob Toppin. It was something it where, mm-hmm. where all five pieces on the floor were like, this is not <laughs> right. Something about this does not make sense. I, I don't get it. So, so Brent, maybe, maybe I'm, you know, maybe that's just him being desperate, trying to find something that works. But what did you think of the rotations and minute distribution and especially the specific lineups that we, we saw, especially given the, the time of game and what what Kentucky needed? Yeah, it, it, it was definitely surprising and confusing. I think those are the two words you used, and I, I think you, you hit the nail on the head there. But um, I, I think there's – there's a couple of things that go into that. First off, it is him, Coach Cal, throwing some things against the wall and seeing what sticks, I think. You know, I, he's just, you know, it, it's early. Again, we didn't have some of those exhibition games to to kind of feel out some of these different rotations, so he's having to do it on the fly. Um, I think a few of those here, you're definitely like, okay, I don't, I don't ever see this one working. Maybe we didn't even need to try this one. But, you know, I, I think he's just trying to work, work through some of that stuff and see who – who fits well together. Um, secondly, and I mean, this is my personal opinion, but Coach Cal has a tendency to like to prove a point sometimes. Really? And I, I think some, news I, really? Right. <laughs> um, and I think that is a little bit, I, I think he's, you know, whether it be he's trying to prove a point to the guys that aren't in the game, like, hey, like, I don't care. I just won't play you and I'll watch – this go up in flames as you're sitting there and then we'll watch the film and figure it out. Um, and I, I think that, you know, it, it sounds a little petty, but I, I think that's a little bit of it too, especially early on in the season. And, you know, he's, he's big on the process and he's big on, you know, being better in February and March than you are in November, and December. And I think he's, he's doing that in front of our eyes as he's trying to probably get through to some of these players of like, Hey, if you're not doing what I'm telling you to do, or you're not, producing in the way that I want you to produce I have enough other guys that I'll throw them in there and we'll, we'll see what can happen but at the same time you know, I, I don't think that Lance Ware and Jacob Toppin are ready for major college basketball right now I mean I I know it kind of worked out for Toppin the other night he was able to get some offensive rebounds and you know dunked a couple or you know had a put back here and there but um, you know he, he's when you watch him play when he isn't able to just catch it and dunk it at the rim, like he is so sped up because he's not like, he's not functioning at a high major level yet. And, and, and that's okay. Like, I mean, he wasn't even like by his own decision, he wasn't going to play this year. And then yeah, it, right. it all of a sudden kind of <laughs> came together. Surprise. Yeah. So it's like, I mean, there's probably a reason why he was like almost not even wanting to play this year. Yeah. And then it just kind of worked out. So we're like, okay, fine. You got a waiver. So do you want to play? Oh, sure. Whatever. And, and then Lance where like, I'm not surprised just because he's like, he brings some things to the table in theory. And I think you know, if he, if he sticks around, he can be a um, contributor, but like right now he's, he's not very good defensively. Like when, when he's guarding on the ball, he's getting pushed around way too much. And then offensively, I mean, even in high school, the dude averaged like 10 points a game in high school. So, you know, it's not like he's a dynamic scorer. Like, he's not going to score it like Olivier Sar does. He's not even going to do the things that Isaiah Jackson does. 
um, because he's just not as – he's not quite as springier as athletic. So, you know, those two guys, as the season goes on, I think you're going to see their minutes really um, deteriorate. And especially when you get Keon back, because you're going to have, you know, another – like, I, I think we're going to get to the point, at least I hope, that we're able to play Isaiah Jackson more as like a backup five man or not. I mean, even if he still starts, it's like then slide him to the five, then you can play key on the four and sure. Like you might need to piece together some minutes from where and top him, but long-term I would, you know, I hate to say it, but I prefer to see them not play. Yeah. I, I would almost say that Jackson is probably better suited to play a five, especially in the modern I game. Think he absolutely is. Yeah. It, that's, I think that's definitely what he'll play at the next level. Um, if not, you know, slide in between those positions. So it's just, it's, it's creating, you know, odd uh, chemistry issues with Saar and Jackson. Cause I feel like they both need to play that position. So it's almost like when Keon comes back, I would really, I would almost like to see him start and just, you know, keep Jackson's minutes the same, but switch the rotations up. And, you know, like you said, Cal's going to see what sticks. He's just going to start throwing things together. And that's usually what he does until we hit the SEC schedule. And that's when he, he'll start to lock in his rotations and, We'll go down to seven or eight players at that point, especially if Keon's healthy. So now there's so there there are two big things that that I I kind of look at and and I think okay the point guard play right now I think is probably the biggest question mark that this team has just in terms of who is your guy who can be the the best so my my gut especially after watching that Morehead State game was that that Devin Askew was the better complimentary piece for BJ Boss and Terrence Clark to kind of let, you know, feed them, create open looks for them. Um, but Askew's simply not doing that right now. Um, I think I saw there was a, like a high level synergy statistic or whatever that he has a turnover rate right now of like 32% of, of his, of his possessions. I mean, nice. flat out, just, just not getting it done. And, and I think that's just more of a, okay, he's – it's very obvious what he brings to the table. It's very obvious that he's going to be a high-level bas- college basketball player one day, maybe even at the end of this year, definitely next year, I- I'd assume. But I kind of thought that going into this year that the pure talent that B.J. Boston and Terrence Clark brought to the table would be able to compensate for that – you know, for those, those issues that Devin Askew, I mean, Devin Askew had four turnovers, I think against uh, Morehead State to open the season. You were like, okay, well, I can live with those. If he has 12 points on two of three shooting from three. And I think, I think he still even had four assists or five assists or whatever. Um, But so you could, you could kind of take the negatives with the plenty of, of positives that he brought, but I just don't know if, if right now the, the reward is, worth the risk right now just because of of how valuable every single possession was and, and how costly every one of those errors were um especially against kansas so i'm curious with you guys what point guard position especially but is there a lineup or a select group of people that you you have seen that go okay I think Cal needs to try this out. I, I think this is the recipe because I put out a, a, a lineup on, on Twitter. I was watching the, di- I was watching the game unfold and I, and I genuinely thought Davion Mintz at the one BJ Boston at the two Cameron Fletcher at the three, then Isaiah Jackson and, and Olivier Saar at the four and five. I think that lineup is something that UK could get something out of, you know, a mix of, of defense with Cameron Fletcher. I'm very, very high on Cameron Fletcher. I think he is exceeding every expectation I had of him going into the year. He has bought into that Khalil Whitney role that I desperately wanted Khalil to have last year. He's bought into that. I think he's been terrific on, on as a perimeter defender, especially this early in his career. I've been very impressed. I'd like to see him alongside the offensive, you know, the, the not as careless – with the ball as, as Terrence Clark has, has been, but just the pure offense with Davion Mintz and BJ Boston. And then alongside Isaiah Jackson and Olivia Sauer, I'm, I'm dying for Calipari to throw that out there once. Is there something that you guys have seen where you're like, this is the recipe. If I were in Calipari's shoes right now, this is what I would throw out there. Zach, I'm, I'm interested to know what you think would work right now. Okay. Well, I wouldn't say a particular lineup, but I do (laughs) – you know, Coach Cal was teasing the, uh, oh, I watched NBA basketball all summer. I'm ready to start doing some more 
shooting more threes or what, what I would like to see is putting Olivier Saar as the hub of the offense, you know, maybe trying not necessarily in a Nikola Jokic role because he's clearly not that good of a passer. And I think part of the reason this won't necessarily work is kind of what Brandon was talking about with the spacing issues, just because they won't be able to make that work to, you know, get themselves open. Um, but I would love to see just more, sh- like I would love to have four shooters on the court with Olivier Saar and just have them spread everything out and try and just, gen- I don't know, just generate anything that can, you know, running off ball screens and handoffs, just anything that can, you know, make the, the defense work a little bit more. And I, I think Olivier Saar can step out and pop it. And if he, that, I think that's something I'd like to see a little bit more too. Um, so it, it, Isaiah Jackson and Olivier Saar, like I was saying, I'm not sure I, I'm a big fan of them playing together. That's probably, that might end up being, you know, what's best for the team just because of how good Jackson is. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see if Calipari is going to, you know, try and do some more NBA style stuff like that he was talking. Cause to, to this point, all I've seen is the exact same offense that Kentucky has ran for the last 11 seasons now. Yeah. I don't know if you agree with that or not, Brandon, but. I yeah. Think. I mean, I, I think the, the, the main thing I would like to see right now, and you know, I, I talk about this about every chance I get, I say it on Twitter some too, and I could probably rant about it for the next hour, but. <laughs> That's what this is for. Right. I I think we need to be setting a lot of ball screens with this team. And I think we need to spread it out and essentially go to a ball screen continuity style offense. And the reason I say that is because we have several guys who are at their best when they have the ball in their hands. I mean, especially when you look at the three freshmen, Askew, Clark, and Boston. Like, those guys want to create. And, and Askew is actually – very good in the ball screen, even right now. And that was something yeah. I, you know, breaking down his film coming out of high school, you know, I, I, I was talking about that and I, I was tracking it during the, the Kansas game. But I think there was, I think that I, if I get this right, I think there was four scenarios where there was a Devin Askew, Olivier Starr side ball screen. Two of them resulted in Olivier Starr jumpers, which is probably our best offense right now is Olivier Starr shooting a 15-foot sh- jump shot. One yeah. of them, asked you came and shot a nice little pull up at the free throw line, and then another one we got Bobby fouled. There. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, you know, and I, I know that's overly simplistic. That's four possessions, but I I still think just conceptually, um, I think that Brandon, uh, you know, BJ Boston, Terrence Clark, I think those guys need um, a little bit more structure to slow them down and to stop them from doing so much true one on one. And I think if we have you know, a, a continuity offense with some ball screens where they can, like, there's a, there's a set structure to it. The spacing is set when the possession starts. And then a lot of it's because I, Olivier Saar is one of the best role men, and I mean that as like a pick and roll man, probably in the country because he has, he has the ability to roll all the way to the rim, slam into you, post up, and then Good we've hands. seen his post package already of the things he can do down there. But then he's also like from that 12 to 17 foot range, he's money on those jump shots. And it, and that's just so hard to guard from a defensive standpoint, when you have a ball handler and the screener so versatile in their ways to score it. And I just think that would solve a lot of our spacing issues as well with being able to kind of piece some guys together in, in different spots in the floor. Um, you know, unfortunately, ball screens is not something that John Calipari generally likes to do. He's more of a, you know, that's why he's the dribble yes. drive motion guy that we don't actually see all that much of all the time. But, um, you know, he, he's, he doesn't really like bringing that screener into, into the play. And, and that's, that's fine, I guess. That's, you know, that's why he's coaching at Kentucky and I'm no longer coaching. So um, <laughs> he probably knows more than I do. But, um, but I, I and I'm not even saying we have to do that every single position. You know, that hasn't doesn't have to need to, that doesn't need to be our primary offense. But I think that if you were to break down the film from three games, I think a lot of our success has come when we've gotten just some random ball screens on our in our offense, and it's something that we could probably go to more. And when I go back to talking about you know Devin Askew not seeming comfortable enough, like when we're just in our whatever you would call our offense currently, like. <laughs> he he needs a like 
he needs a ball screen or he clearly needs some help to get him down in the scoring area like I was talking about to initiate our offense because right now he's just not able to do that kind of breaking down his man one-on-one and um, he is pretty advanced on the ball screen I just think that's something that we could look for uh, moving forward and to, yeah. and to kind of build off your initial point like you know we know that Terrence Clark and BJ Boston are excellent one-on-one players we know that they can get to the rim whenever they want but the thing about the college game is, is the defenses are just they're smarter than that they know they are going to bring help they're going to make it impossible especially for these guys that are essentially twigs to try and get these shots off so and you, they don't have the experience I guess is the good word to know you know to dish that ball off so that's why where, where Brandon was saying more ball screens just anything that can you know give them just an inch more space because that's all they need is just a yeah. little bit more space yeah and, and it provides some structure yeah, yeah I think that's that is the the biggest like aha moment that I'm I'm hoping like we're not wanting them to reinvent the wheel we we know that BJ Boss and Terrence Clark that they're that is what they are best at and and that's how they got the majority of their scoring opportunities at the high school level we don't want them to completely change what they're good we're not trying to reinvent the wheel here but everything is just so simple right now create some level of confusion for the defense mix things up you know like you like brandon said create you know have some some ball screens create open space to allow you know better driving lanes to create better uh you know and, and if, if nothing else, it creates more, op- you know, jump shot opportunities in the pick and roll for, for, uh, you know, Olivier Saar, uh, like you said, with, with Devin Askew, he's more comfortable whenever he gets a little bit of help. That was his biggest not coming out of high school is that he doesn't, you know, he's, he's great with a lot of, uh, you know, once he gets into that open space, he's fantastic, but he does, you know, dribble separation is an issue. It has been for, for a long time. He doesn't have the, just the pure quickness and, and speed that a lot of, um, you know, Kentucky point guards have had in the past. So in order to compensate for that, create some open space for him, let him, you know, give him some open looks through ball screens and and let him do what he's best at uh, in that intermediate game, like, like Brandon was talking about. There's, and that's kind of that, okay, we know that this team has a lot of strengths where they're very good at. We're just not putting him in those positions right now to, do what they're best at and I and I'm hoping and this is this is kind of my big last question for you guys I guess is what are you guys hoping to see in like what is something when when we're going into this Georgia Tech game this weekend obviously understanding the competition level understanding that yeah they're a name brand school but understanding that they are not a good team at all right now what are you wanting that after that game that you will come away going ah we got this done. This is exactly what I wanted them to do. What's the one thing that you are both looking for, um, you know, the, your biggest takeaway for, for Georgia Tech going into it? Zach, we'll start with you. I'd actually like to hear Brandon go first on this one. Okay. Brandon. So I can steal his ideas and feed off him. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, so the, the thing I would like to see, and, you know, this is harder to conceptualize, I guess, for, for fans, but, you know, from the way I look at things, like I, I want to see more offensive structure, and I want to see us fix those two issues that I talked about with playing outside the scoring area and our, our spacing issues. Yeah, no, that, that's not, you know, it's easier to say I want to see us make 10 threes. Well, I think that's going to, I, I guess I'm talking about fixing the, yeah. the problem. And then we're like, th- th- those other things are kind of symptoms of the actual sickness, so to speak. Yes. And our sickness is our offensive structure the symptoms of that are not making any shots, turning the ball over, those sort of things. So, you know, like when I go back and watch the film and I put up my article on KSR on Monday, I want to be more positive about the offense. That's what I want to see out of the game. And I think that, you know, again, you know, to kind of put it in layman's terms for the everyday fan, that that would mean making more outside shots. That would mean turning it over 12 times or less. Um, and then, you know, the, the other thing I would say, um, I would be slightly careful. And I, I just want to say this just in case anything gets wonky on Sunday, like Georgia tech, isn't terrible. Yeah. They, I mean, they went 17 and 14 last year. They won 11 games in the ACC and they bring a lot of players back. Like they, they have two all ACC performers on their team from a year ago. 
they have another guy in Moses Wright who is averaging 25 and a half points a game through two games this season. Um, and he's a six, nine athletic guy who, um, you know, can cause some problems in the post. Like the, the biggest thing that scares me for that, not to get too deep into it here, but like, I'm afraid that Olivia Sar is going to be in foul trouble guarding Moses Wright because of the way he can drive it at him. And you know, that, that, that would be a cause for an early alarm in the game. If we're not able to, to keep him around, that's obviously something he struggled with so far, but you know, I, I would just urge fans to remember that a Georgia tech wasn't practicing with the contact up until the very first game of the season. Um, so they're true. They're behind. Also they have older guys like they have, they have a senior and a junior in the backcourt who have been all ACC guys. They have, like I said, a big man who's good. Uh, Kentucky fans might remember Bubba Parm. He is still playing college basketball. He's on the team. <laughs> it's amazing. And, it's incredible. You know, he, he can come in and, and yes, like when you look at their stats, um, you have to remember they've literally played an extra half of basketball because they went to four overtimes. So some of their stats look kind of insane, but um, you know, the, they're not terrible. I, 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 I'm not saying that Kentucky won't handle them because we certainly should, we should win by 15, but like don't necessarily be shocked if it's close at halftime. I know that's not what anybody wants to hear. So I'm sorry for bringing down the mood, but like the, I, <laughs> I just we gotta want to be realistic. The on we got to be realistic with with what we're right. At. Yeah, and, and you know, th- th- there's going to be a lot of talk. I'm sure Matt and especially Ryan are going to talk about it in the pregame show. They're going to say how terrible Georgia Tech is. I'm just here to tell you, Georgia Tech is not terrible. And I'll cede my time to Zach. <laughs> if there is a, if there is the best time, if there was a perfect time to be playing this Georgia Tech team, I would say probably right now while yep. they're because they get are get it so done now. So behind, Still they're going to get better. It. Yep. Yeah. It, this could end up being, if things go as planned and as, as we're hoping, it could end up looking like a very solid win at the end of the year. If yeah. if things if Kentucky executes the way that they should and beats them by you know that 10, 15 points as, as they should, it could end up looking pretty positive for them at the end of the year when, when things start clicking for them. Zachary. Um, I'll, I'll keep harping on the Olivier Sar stuff because I really would just like to see – because I think – it. He's our best player. I don't, obviously, he's not our most talented player, but I think the best player needs to get the most talented players involved. Um, and it starts with giving Sar the ball. And, you know, instead of having Brandon and Terrence create their downhill action, they need to be receiving the downhill action as they're going downhill. That's, that's what I would like to see more is just get them, like we're just, the spacing word seems to be the buzzword today is just a little bit more space. And, you know, they've been, they shot 21 threes against Kansas. Um, I wouldn't say uh, – how many of those do you think were good shots, though? Were, like, actual good three attempts, would you say? Yeah. Out of those 20. Maybe. 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 Yeah. So it's – and they only made three of them. So I would uh, – anything that can just kind of generate more more outside shots. I, if they can shoot 21 threes a game, I think Kentucky's probably going to be in a good spot for the rest of the year because I th- eventually they're going to start hitting them because they had the players are just too good. And Calipari has shooters, not make – or wh- whatever that nonsense line is. They act, these guys can shoot the ball. We, we know they can. So that's what I'm looking for. I just want, I want to see more, more from Sar. And I know he's kind of already been involved a lot. And it seems like he kind of is our only go-to offense right now. Um, so why not just keep playing on that and have him get the other guys involved so they're not pressing to make plays every other, every other time down the court. Because if I have to watch, you know, Terrence Clark shoot a mid-range jumper with three guys on him, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say some choice words as well myself. <laughs> Yeah, I yeah, I, I I I think offensively, going back to Brandon's point, that's definitely the thing that I'm. I, I just got to see some level of structure. I mean, I I 100% agree there. I mean, that's just the what we've watched over the last two games have just been painful. I mean, I, I was literally up up on press row at that at the game, and every single and I mean, it was just completely silent, just massive echo through the whole place. And every single just dribble, 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 dribble. Oh, shoot. Uh, four seconds left of the shot clock. I don't know what I'm doing. Okay. Uh, James Harden step back mid, you know, 18 footer. I was just, it was just like, Oh, like, I mean, I, like I let out probably six groans watching that game. Not even, I mean, it just, I, I don't care what basketball game I'd be watching. It's not like I was trying to be unprofessional on the, on press row or anything, but, but, but like, I mean, it's just bad basketball, painful basketball to watch. And I just, I just want to see some level of, 
of cohesiveness and, and continuity and just something to something that on Mon like brain like like brandon said on monday that we say wow they they finally got this part fit I, i'm not expecting it to be a, a finished beautiful product or by any stretch of the imagination but i just want to see some level of of structure on monday going okay this is something we can build off of and that's that is my 100 percent biggest biggest thing i'm looking for i just got to see some level of structure some level of cohesiveness moving forward basic fundamentals is what it seems like we're all kind of harping on is what it's boiling down to is just playing team basketball which is in fairness you know they none of these guys have really ever had to do before yeah for most of them at least besides sar and mince but like we were saying earlier that's like throwing two guys into a an offense that they have no idea what they're doing so yeah yeah so tell us, tell us about your uh, experience in Indy real quick, Jack. I don't know how much we've kind of been going a while, so we might, we might wrap up here shortly, but definitely tell us about what happened. Um, I haven't, I haven't heard, I haven't heard your. It was uh, the Bankers Life Fieldhouse crew. They are, it was a brand new, I mean, you, th this event got put together in the last like two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, just because they would, you know, it was supposed to be in Chicago originally, or it was supposed to be in Orlando originally, kind of tentatively got moved to Chicago. There were rumors that it was going to be in Lexington or Lawrence because of, you know, there were rumors that Duke was going to play their home, home game schedule, home and home. So you could tell very, very obviously that this was something that they were not prepared for. This was a last second put together event. Um, the, we, so I got there like I think the the pressed credential place opened up at seven o'clock. So two and a half hours before tip off. So plenty of time, not like scrambling right before tip off. Like this was, uh, should have been as, as easy and seamless as a, as a process as possible. Get there. You go to the media door where you're supposed to walk in and, you know, get signed in all that stuff. Every door was locked. The, the entire thing was locked. Uh, one security guard comes up to the door and is like, the hell is this guy doing here? Who are you? He opens the you're door. Basketball player. He's like, you're not supposed to be here. And I'm like, uh, this is the media door. I'm supposed to be going in the media. And they're like, uh, I don't, you're not, nobody told me that you're supposed to be here. So I would suggest going around uh, the back to the, there's a double glass door, go back there. So I walk my ass all the way around the arena, walk in through the double glass door. And the, it's like the team personnel, like walking in with, every you know they're like so have you been in contact with this have you been doing this what are your symptoms with this um are you a ball boy are you a blah blah blah, blah? and i'm like this is not the room i'm supposed to be in <laughs> at all and uh so we get through security and the people behind you know after security they're like you guys are not supposed to be here you are not affiliated with any team get out i don't know where you're supposed to be but just don't be here so it was like me and like two or three other media media guys we leave and we had to go all the way right back around to the other other end and finally they coordinated was like well you're not supposed to come in this way but i guess we can go in that way we walk in finally get checked in i go into the elevator that's supposed to send us up to press row and i say uh with the media and the dude's like oh I think you're going down here and he goes down and I'm like, this isn't right. I can already <laughs> tell this is something about this isn't right. So I go down, take two steps and I'm like in the, the belly of bankers life field house. And there's some like poor, innocent, like 18 year old minimum wage. Like just, she just got probably just got hired on Craigslist. Like just tried to make some money on, on a late Tuesday night. She's just trying to do her job. I ask her, uh, yeah, I'm looking for, for press row. And she's like, you could tell she's like, this was not in the training manual. I have no idea what I'm supposed to do with this. She's like, I think you're supposed to go this way. And like, she sends me out to the court. So I'm like out on the floor and I'm like, probably not supposed, Definitely to, not supposed to be here. Definitely not supposed <laughs> to be here. Um, I'm like, but I'll take pictures and videos until somebody sends me elsewhere. They finally like swarm me and you're like, they're like, you're not supposed to be here. Where are you supposed to be? So it ended up being like a, they sent me, up to the rafters up and around they sent me to like where the photographers were supposed to be um like definitely not supposed to be here and then after like five or six different no you're supposed to be here okay no actually go this way they finally found this little press row that part ended up being fine 
Um, and then, you know, and they were just very apologetic. They, and what, there was one security guard that was like, first night jitters, I promise you that we're, that we're just trying to get, get through this. And I'm in like, you know, they were all very sweet and kind, but you could just tell that they were just very overwhelmed with how put together. This imagine, imagine if they had 16,000 people or 18 or however many yeah. that places fits. Imagine if they had to do all that. It was not ready to, I mean, and, and that was kind of my biggest overall takeaway. And, and like after the game, the game ended and uh, like it was like five minutes later and one of the security guards came up and was like, all right, guys, time to get out of here. And like Calipari <laughs> was still like 10 minutes away from coming out for his post-game press conference. And we're like, sorry, no. we sorry, we're staying. <laughs> we have to work. And they were like, press conference. What? Like they had, I'm still convinced to this day, they had no idea what we were doing there, but I still not a basketball game. I, I don't think they, they were aware of what like, media or you know like what the media was doing there or whatever but in terms of just the actual event itself it was you know we're talking about how they reverted back to you know some of their aau characteristics and all that imagine begging a team for you know to to not revert back to all their old ways and then driving them up two hours into indianapolis for no reason i mean there's there was no like it didn't help the local economy of you know lexington or lawrence kansas like you know it, it could have if it were at you know either of those locations you or know, indianapolis since there were no fans oh right right, right. and it's <laughs> yeah exactly made there no was sense no there was no reason to be there i mean there were there were no fans it was an awkward awkward experience just no it, you could just tell nobody wanted to be there at that given time it was just an awkward i mean as soon as the, as soon as the ball was tipped they dribbled the ball up the floor for the first time and it was dead silence. And I kind of looked at the, the dude sitting next to me on, on press road and it was just like, this is the weirdest thing I've ever been a part of. I mean, we are, the basketball game has begun and you would have no idea. I mean, if you were sitting there like down looking down at your phone, you would have no idea that there was a game going on. I mean, it was just the most bizarre atmosphere and it made me feel bad for these kids. I mean, imagine growing up being a high level basketball being a high level basketball player, you sign, you, you sign at a place like Kentucky because you want to play in these high profile events, because this is, you know, the, the, the Mecca, this is the, the, the gold standard of college basketball and your first hurrah, your first introduction into the college basketball world that the champions classic is supposed to be. You're sitting there in an empty NBA. It's not like the NBA bubble, wherever everything was enclosed and, you know, kind of compact, they kind of felt homey almost this was like a massive convention center. Imagine going to like an EYBL event or something and having it be a massive convention center, conference hall, whatever, and being the only people there. Just dead silence, massive echo. I mean, it was, I mean, it, it had to have been a depressing and disappointing for these players that have grown up dying for this massive opportunity and they, they won't get that and be awkward and, and, you know, sparking nerves. And I mean, it just, it was a situation that I, I came away, I, the, the game ended, and I thought, why are we doing this? Like, why are we here right now? Why could we not have, have figured out a home-and-home home situation with Kentucky and, and Kansas or at least done something, you know. You think the that's game. why they did it? Was so they didn't have to deal with a home-and-home home thing? It would have been more beneficial to everybody involved. It, at the very least, the Lexington, you know, whether it was in Lexington or, or Lawrence, the local hotels would have gotten at least one or two nights of, of, you know, stay right. the f local food joints would at least have had, you know, at least a, a little bit of added and shoot. I don't you know Rupp arena has 15% of fans allowed. I don't know about Kansas right now, but the, we probably would have at least gotten some fans allowed, but with yeah. this, it was just nobody there wanted to be there, including the players and including the teams. I genuinely got that feel that it was just something that, that this was a we're doing this because they put this together at the last second and we're just doing what we're told. We're just trying to make things work. But it was something that it if if it if they could have redone it, I guarantee you they would have gone the the home and home route or simply just, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I personally don't even know what I would do, but it was just the, the final product was something that you could just tell it was dull and it was something that everybody involved kind of came away thinking – why are we doing this? Why are we here right now? So I'm, I think the not, the, the neutral floor, non, the no fan allowed experience probably needs to 
come to a st- I think if we're going to do these big events, you know, the, we're going this weekend, we're going to the holiday hoops giving down in Atlanta. I'm, I'm, you know, no fans. They just announced no fans were going to be allowed to that. I have a feeling it's going to be the same exact feel. I mean, I, big th- I, think, I think these games are better suited for like a Memorial Coliseum. Perfect. Because I've Perfect. Done, even with the 15% fans at Memorial, you know, it's, it's quiet. It, it is weird. Like, you know, you can hear the coaches yelling at the players the whole time, but it's not as weird because it, it would almost be better if they just kind of do what the NBA did and just have an actual AAU style setup. And that would probably benefit our AAU players more, you know, playing in that atmosphere as opposed yeah. to an empty gym of 20,000 people. So, but I would, I mean, I would, I would be perfectly fine. I honestly, if, if Kentucky did away with fans entirely, they should just go, straight to Memorial and play all the games there. Cause I don't think there's any reason to play them at rep at that point. Yeah. yeah it, it doesn't really make sense. Why if you're going to have, a, I mean, especially if you have no fans, like I, I get it. If you're going to have 15%, well, 15% of a bigger number is a bigger number. So I understand playing it, you know, that those games are up. But yeah, any of these events with no fans, like you could yeah, play it at transit. Like, yeah, yeah, I did, yeah. But play it in a smaller gym. So it's not so weird. Or if you still want to come to Indianapolis, like play it at like, you can play to the state fairgrounds Coliseum where IUPUI plays like that yeah, seats sure. 4,500 people. Like, or if, if you're going to go like this holiday hoops giving at Georgia tech, like, I mean, I've been watching Georgia tech film the last couple of days, like their arena is insane because their players are sitting in the stands because of how their bench is set up. Cause like really? a, a lot of these teams, like, like at rough, there's enough room where they just like on the sidelines where they just move the seats around. Well, like, mm-hmm it's just like a bowl, like a wooden bleacher bowl at Georgia Tech. So like the players are literally sitting like in the fifth row and then nice. passers turning around and like waving them down. It's like, just play it at like Emory or some like division three yeah. school in Atlanta. Like there's no reason to be doing this. Yeah. Yeah. Th- that was just the, the, the most frustrating was just like outside of how horrible the game was, how mind numbing the offense looked like outside of just the obvious things it was just like and we're here for no reason like if if there were if there was a local revenue impact or at least some mm-hmm. level of fans they didn't even have fan noise they didn't even have artificial yeah sound. they should have pumped in fan noise that was, was ridiculous it was silent it was silent i don't know if i got if if i'm gonna get in trouble for po- I, I i posted a, a twitter video of just like aimed away from the court um but on i did a, like a final takeaways i i uploaded to the site a a video of the court itself of what it actually looked like at that time it was only like five or six seconds and nothing was actually happening I mean it was just right after tip so hopefully I don't get in trouble for it but it was just something it was just like you guys have to see what I'm seeing you guys have to hear this this is and I don't know if it came through on the tv with the commentators but you heard every single word that Calipari said, every single word that the ref said back to Calipari, what they were, you know, Bill Self screaming, uh, you know, the, the players getting yelled at. I mean, it was, it, it was an intimate feeling like a, of a, of like an intimate setting, but it wasn't, I mean, it was just an eerie, just odd, bizarre thing that I'm going to look back at like 10 years from now, whenever all this stuff happens. And it's like, I can't believe we did that. Like that was such just a, just a weird it was easily the most bizarre basketball experience any I mean any sporting event really of my life by far I mean it's just something that I I cannot believe they went through with and it actually happened and I mean they had a they had a whole blueprint the NBA gave them months of a blueprint to show you to show you how to televise a game with no fans mm -hmm. and they and they didn't do anything like that yeah they said let's just send them up we're gonna do whatever we we want and yeah. we're going to screw it up terribly. So and I don't know if that was no ESPN. excuse. I don't know if, who who were who made that final call on that. But I mean, it was just nobody wanted to be there. It was just a, such a live and learn missed opportunity is probably the best best way to put it. You could have you could have done something cool, historic with Memorial Coliseum. Like wow, we haven't had a Kentucky basketball, Kentucky men's basketball game there in in decades, and cool. or I guess the have they they've played a men's game within the last like 15 years there right 20 years have they? i can't have they? i can't remember one sure. i don't remember I, I i guess maybe i'm thinking like freedom hall they i know they've done some some smaller yeah. events but anyway it hasn't cool. been normal they should do it in a long 
time. Yeah, I yeah. think that would have been a really cool thing, or at least experimented with something like what Brandon is, Brandon's saying, go to a D3 school, go to a transy, go to something like that if you don't want to be in a big echoey abyss of, of, a, of an arena. Um, I, that, I think that would be 10 times – a better experience, especially for the players. I, I just, I came away feeling really up, not just understanding of the disappointment of the players that if they came away, you know, a little bit upset that this experience wasn't what they really wanted. I just, I don't know. I just feel bad for them. Hey, just come back. <laughs> that is true. Come back That's another year. True. Yeah. I'd, I would take a year two of BJ Boston and Terrence Clark any day, all day. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, guys, we've gone way over. So I think we're going to we're gonna try and wrap it up here. Let's do it. Any final thoughts uh, before ahead of Sunday's game? Um, no, no women's basketball talk today. Sorry, folks, but I will be. We got plenty of content coming on the site for that, so don't worry. Good. Yeah. Um, no, just show me, in a, show me an offense that, that I can be happy with and that we can work with moving forward, and uh, we'll be happy. Yeah, yeah, I just want to. See us, see us play better, execute some more things offensively, definitely have some more structure like we kind of harped on throughout this podcast. And if you, if you do those things, the score is going to take care of itself. I mean, especially in this game where we're clearly the better team, even though I mm-hmm. did temper the expectations a little bit. But you know, so we, that's we, what we, we certainly are. Here. Yeah, we're, <laughs> we're better. We're more talented. If you, if you did execute some things offensively, like I said, score is going to take care of itself and we'll feel better Sunday night come – um, a nice win hopefully no hot no hot takes for you jack not this time Smart. i I, Smart. I burned i burned that bridge last time so yeah, we're keep gonna to yourself this week w- w- wait till wait till we go on a little bit of a little bit of a run here in the middle we'll get them back i can't wait till we beat georgia tech by nine and, and jack comes on this co- podcast declaring national champions yeah <laughs> I, will. I will just just wait on it just yeah, wait i'm here for it well I, I i think we'll wrap it up here brandon Big, big thanks for coming on. We've been wanting to have you on for a while, and we'll definitely have you on again if you would uh, like to. I think this is a good episode here. Um, absolutely. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Thanks a lot for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Jack, Brandon, thank you all very much, and we'll catch you all next time. Yes, sir. Talk to you later. <laughs>